Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to another webinar that AN Senioro is hosting. My name is Kritika, and I am the Head of Customer Success at AN Senioro. Today, I'm very, very glad to be hosting this webinar, uh, which is going to be presented by Professor Andrea Ansar on low-intensity TES protocols for the treatment of chronic pain and migraine, the current status of it, the future directions that this domain will take. Um, Professor Andrea Antal, who you already see on video right now, holds a position as an extraordinary professor at the University of Medical Center in Göttingen, Germany. She also heads the non-invasive brain stimulation lab at the Department of Neurology. And she's one of the world's leading experts on developing direct current TDCS or alternating current stimulation tax protocols. Um, the focus of a research group is to introduce safe and individualized transcranial brain stimulation protocols into everyday clinical practice. As most of our webinars go, first we will listen to Professor Andrea Antal's wonderful presentation. Then we will watch a demo video, which is very relevant to this webinar, which has been prepared by my colleagues in ANT North America, Casey Shalette, who is our CEO of ANT North America and also an expert within the extended ANT uh, neuro team for TES neuromodulation. Um, during the course of the presentation, me and my colleagues in the back end, we will be monitoring the chat. So feel free to send in your questions to Professor Antal or Casey um, or to us in general. Um, and one of us will make sure to address it towards the end of the presentation in the Q&A session. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to thank Professor Antal very much for accepting our invite. And I look very much forward to your talk. Please go forward. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yeah, so it's it's again strange to talk to my with my laptop now because I cannot see you. And I can see that there are 42 participants, but of course, <laughs> this is a very special situation. So my name is Andrea Antal. I have been working here at the University Medical Center Göttingen for 23 years now. So I have been doing brain stimulation for 23 years. And before um, um, I worked in the clinical neuro neurophysiology that was closed in 2021 because the head of the department, Professor Paulus, retired. Probably you know this name very well because um, um, most of the brain stimulation, transcranial brain stimulation methods were born here in Göttingen. Concerning low-intensity electrical stimulation, the first study was published in um, 2000, 2001, and uh, the first alternating current stimulation study in 2006 or 2007, and after came random noise stimulation. So I try my presentation now here. My group, we are integrated now in the neurology, and um, we have a lab called Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation Lab and a private practice for patients because we are ready to treat patients with this uh, transcranial brain stimulation method. So the lab is pretty big, lots of co-workers. Partly our direction is chronic pain uh, and mainly fibromyalgia. So um, six or Seven uh, students and postdocs are working on uh, developing new protocols, finding biomarkers in this disorder. Um, the other chronic pain condition is uh, cancer pain, after, for example, hemotherapy. And uh, the second part of the group is stimulating um, healthy subjects, elderly healthy subjects or patients with my cognitive impairment in order to improve cognition. So I have no conflict of interest concerning this talk. However, I have several grants and I am um, um, a vice president of the European Society for Brain Stimulation and member at large of the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology. And um, currently um, I am a paid advisor by Pulvinar. So let's talk about brain stimulation. The left side, on the left side, you can see the classical uh, repetitive magnetic stimulation, somewhat stronger, somewhat older. And the right side, 
the low intensity transcranial electrical stimulation. Here we can apply direct current stimulation, what I mentioned, and uh, random noise stimulation, or just using one frequency alternating current stimulation. However, there are plenty of um, important factors that we have to consider before we start the stimulation. Um, related to TDCS, the polarity of the stimulation, do we want to use anodal stimulation, cathodal stimulation? How long do we want to stimulate? How intense do we want to stimulate? And there is one more important factor, the neuronal history, the state of the brain before and during stimulation. And similar to RTMS, when we are using, let's say, low frequency or high frequency stimulation, we can induce, let's say, inhibition or facilitation in the human brain, the cortex. Nevertheless, we have to consider, so the terminology is not optimal here, because what we can see during and after stimulation that, for example, the size of the motor evoke potential is changing, or subjects are getting better or worse if we have a cognitive task, or the reaction time is changing. However, we do not know is due to inhibition or excitation. Um, I think here what we are changing, the excitatory inhibitory balance in the brain, there are plenty of major questions that we can answer when we are using non-invasive brain stimulation methods. Um, the first two, that is with light gray, not so important for us. Of course, we have theoretical problems. We want to understand how does the brain work until today. Uh, the second one, how to enhance cognition. This is a general and a very fancy direction now. Nevertheless, the third one is most important for us, how to prevent, how to cure or delay neurological and psychiatric disorders. So we can use brain stimulation as a tool. And here would be the, the main aim, how can we match the stimulation protocol to the pathophysiology of the patient so we can give something like an individualized stimulation when it is needed. Generally, what happens um, during stimulation, and from here, I would like to talk about transcranial electrical stimulation. When we are using TDCS or TACS, first, we induce short-term changes in, in the brain. First, we open voltage-dependent ion channels. And depending on where we are stimulating, um, how many channels we can open, of course, Slowly, we can induce longer term changes. We can change the neurotransmitter activity, mainly the glutamate, GABA, dopamine levels. We can change the level of neuronal excitation. We can increase or decrease synaptic strength and efficacy. At the case of TACS, we probably induce entrainment. And at the case of TRNS, probably we change the signal to noise ratio. If we repeat the stimulation several times, five times, 10 times, 30 times, probably we induce functional changes in the brain and we can change the net network dependent activity. Nevertheless, please do not forget that if we have at least two electrodes on the scalp, we stimulate everything between these two electrodes because the current is flowing between the two electrodes. And we are stimulating not only the neuronal element, but the non-neuronal element too. Unfortunately, we have to consider plenty of factors when we design an electrical stimulation experiment. The physical parameters, of course, um, we, uh, we can plan and we can um, um, so we can control, let's say, because we know what we want to do, what kind of montage we would like to use, how much intensity we need for duration, and how many sessions we would like to apply. The problem is starting when we are using TACS, so alternating current stimulation and not, not TDCS, because here we have two more factors, the frequency and the phase. 
And if you consider the size of the electrodes, from, from the first point, a never-ending story starts. Because you can change each parameter, and it's very difficult to find really the best protocol given condition. So we have to pilot a lot. Second part, the second point, anatomical parameters. This is what we cannot control, cannot change. However, we can measure. If we have the possibility, for example, to move MRI, and we can measure exactly the thickness of the cerebrospinal fluid because it conducts very well. Or we can just measure with a tape how big is the head. Or we can use neural navigation and we can put the electrodes exactly at the same place if we have to repeat the stimulation. The third point, the physiological parameters. And this is very difficult to control because um, as I mentioned, one of the most important factors what can change the efficacy of the stimulation, the state of the brain, what the patient or subject are doing during stimulation. Are they in rest? Or do they have a cognitive task? Or for example, a motor task? If you check the literature, you can see that the stimulation many times is combined with, with the task. However, this one can increase the variability of the outcomes during the stimulation. And depending on these factors, if we are using, for example, cathodal direct current stimulation, we can increase cortical excitability or we can decrease cortical excitability. Same is true for anodal stimulation or TACS when we are applying different frequencies. So therefore, <laughs> it is extremely difficult to find the best protocol and an optimal protocol for a given disorder or patient population. Chronic pain uh, has a different pathology as compared to acute pain syndromes. And in chronic pain, usually there is no or very little peripheral damage, injury, or inflammation. Um, what we can see that there are dramatic plastic changes in the central nervous system. Some of the changes are maladaptive changes, and some of the changes are compensatory changes. Generally, we say now that chronic pain is a result of maladaptive plasticity. For example, if you think about phantom limb pain or pain after stroke. Finding biomarkers in chronic pain is very difficult um, issue because what we should measure. So the patients are coming to us and they tell us that, okay, they have pain here and there. And we have to accept what the patient is telling us. I have very strong pain um, in a visual analog scale um, between zero and 10. I have 9, 10, or something like this. Nevertheless, pain perception is very, very subjective. Usually, we are considering just one symptom, pain. How strong is it? Morning and the evening. Or we can consider a combination of um, symptoms. For example, chronic pain patients are very frequently uh, depressed. They have sleep problems. And um, therefore, it's good that if we can use, for example, questionnaires um, like life quality questionnaires or SF36, that several factors are considered. Nevertheless, if we are treating patients, let's say, same type of patients who have the same disorder with the same protocol, even here we can see a huge variability. Some patients are fast, quick responders, 
and other patients react late. Several patients are react to placebo stimulation and they don't react to real stimulation. Or the other direction, they react to real stimulation and they do not react to placebo stimulation or they react to both of them. When we have a clinical study and we start even with the most simple protocol, at the case of chronic pain, I would say stimulation of the primary motor cortex using anodal stimulation for 10 days. Even this very simple protocol, we will have responders, let's say in fibromyalgia patients, 70%, and we have non-responders, that's about 30%. It would be very nice to know why some patients react to the stimulation and other patients do not, because that way, uh, we, can, we could have something like predictive biomarkers to start the stimulation or maybe to start with an another protocol or using not TDCS, but using magnetic stimulation, but is much, much stronger. However, we were not the first to use electricity to, to, to treat chronic pain. About 2,000 years ago, Scribonius Largius was a medical doctor. Uh, and lived in Italy, used the electric fish to treat patients with, with chronic pain. Unfortunately, uh, he killed some of the patients because uh, the, the voltage, what this kind of fish can give out, sometimes very high. So there are um, fish, there's a strong fish, and there's a weak fish. And he was not able to differentiate between the weak fish and the strong fish. However, they um, made very nice note, and 2,000 years later, we can see what he did that time. Here you can see the first book was published in Hamburg, 1802, and there are plenty of case studies with migraine, um, back pain, where this, this Christoph Friedrich Ivig treated patients, um, but nevertheless with the uh, single stimulation session. And here you can see the first paper was, was published 1959, effect of electroconvulsive therapy on intracranial pain. However, this was an innovative stimulation method. Why we are using transcranial brain stimulation? So a considerable percentage of patients does not respond to pharmacotherapy or they do not want to take medication, or they have serious or, or strong adverse effects, or um, not serious, but strong adverse effects when they are taking medication. And therefore, they are looking for something else. The second point, there is an increasing interest in non-pharmacological strategies to treat neurological and psychiatric disorders. Do we have guidelines how to use transcranial stimulation, for example, transcranial electrical stimulation to treat different kinds of disorders? Yes, this was the first one. And um, usually the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology publishes this kind of guidelines. Concerning TDCS, uh, we collected all of the studies until 2016. And we published in this guideline. This guideline will be updated 2024. And it's high time to update this guideline because the problem was that time we did not have enough studies. And none of the conditions, none of the disorders reach the level of A, which means the definite efficacy. But again, it does not mean that the stimulation did not work in this patient population. It means that we did not have enough data to analyze that time. However, it was very clear that time that level B recommendation, probable efficacy, it will be, uh, I mean, useful in fibromyalgia and major depressive disorder. 
and I can tell you now that fibromyalgia and depression will get level A in the in the new guidelines. So it, it look like chronic pain. The problem is that um, we have very heterogeneous conditions. We have studies, plenty of studies. Um, but as I mentioned, um, here we have to compare, for example, with patient with central neuropathic pain and postoperative pain. Because almost all of the conditions we are using the same stimulation protocol. Why we are stimulating the primary motor cortex? Indeed, if you open PubMed and you write chronic pain, TDCS, it will give you out primary motor cortex and the return electrode over the contralateral orbit. Okay, that is an initial experience from invasive stimulation studies. And Chubokawa was the first who stimulated patients with stroke invasively. And she noticed that after primary motor cortex stimulation, they have less pain. So we just copied this protocol and we are using the stimulation not invasively, but transcranially. And here, so the red one is the primary motor cortex stimulation, where we stimulate the motor cortex. And of course, through this kind of stimulation, we can reach deeper cortical areas. For example, indirectly, the thalamus. Nevertheless, the other electrode is over the frontal cortex and very close to the anterior cingulate cortex um, where we uh, make, let's say, our decision or, or emotional decision, how strong is the pain? This is a new paper, new, absolutely new paper, published in 2023. Nevertheless, okay, first thing it was done in animals. This is a mice study. But this was the first time uh, where they found that uh, through stimulation of the primary motor cortex, uh, the nucleus accumbens can be reached. And that way, it, it's part of the, of the reward circuitry. And that way, it is suggested in the paper that um, we can indeed decrease pain perception and chronic pain perception using this anatomical and physiological method. Let's see what kind of concrete studies we have. This was the first study in 2006. Mm, the problem was with the first studies that um, they had very low number of patients. Most of the studies were not blinded or single blinded. And here you can see that only six patients were in the placebo group. The effect of Placebo stimulation in chronic pain patients is relatively high. About 30-40% of the patients react to placebo stimulation. So they are getting better, mainly at the beginning of the stimulation. Here you can see that they stimulated the primary motor cortex. And even after two-day stimulation, there was a significant decrease of pain perception in back pain patients. Um, fibromyalgia, again, the first paper in 2009. Here they used placebo stimulation, primary motor cortex stimulation, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation. The strongest stimulation was the anodal primary motor cortex stimulation. Again, just five-day stimulation, two milliampere. 
at 20 minutes per day, but a nice decrease even in the follow-up, considering the pain perception. This is one of the best studies concerning fibromyalgia. Here they had a parallel group design, a little bit higher number of patients. The first time, 18 patients in each group, and stimulated not for five days, but 10 days. This is generally a very, how can I say, a frequent discussion, how long should we stimulate in a chronic pain patients? Most of the groups are stimulating for 10 days. It means that twice, five days, and not during weekend. Other groups are stimulating for five days. And again, in China, in many Asian countries, they are stimulating continuously for 14 days for two weeks. What is better or, or worse? I don't know. What I can suggest that stimulate at least 10 times because you will have stronger and longer lasting effect if you are you choosing this protocol. Here you can see that this was a double binded study that uh, in the real stimulation group, the pain perception really decreased in fibromyalgia patients when they were using different kind of um, scales and questionnaires. This was all study and this is a pilot study. Indeed, here in Göttingen, we stimulated a group of patients with, with different kind of uh, pain pathologies because we believe that, okay, chronic pain is chronic pain. We are using exactly the same protocol. And um, what we reached about a 30% decrease in pain perception. Um, nevertheless, some of the patients reacted better than others. The patients with face pain were the best or back pain. And we had problem with uh, phantom pain and that time, for example, with fibromyalgia. Nevertheless, again, our group was very heterogeneous. Here in this study, they treated patients with low back pain. And you can see a high number of patients, finally 92 patients, and they were treated four weeks, three times per week, using sham or another stimulation over a perimotor cortex. Nevertheless, they combined it with peripheral stimulation. Because as I mentioned before, the combination of methods are sometimes working better. And here you can see the proportion of responders. The first question is here, what is or the, which percent of improvement is a significant improvement for the patient? I would say if they experience about 30, 40 percent of pain perception um, or pain decrease, um, this would be a significant improvement in quality of life of the patient. Here you can see that the portion of responders was somewhat higher in the DDCS and the combination group compared to the sham stimulation group. Another example, uh, this patient had a disorder and they had pain because of the treatment. However, in this double-blind sham control study, the same protocol worked very well. An anodal primary motor cortex stimulation decreased pain perception again. I would like to show you a negative study with a high number of subjects. 135 patients pick back pain. Nevertheless, please note that here they stimulated only for five days. And probably this five-day stimulation was not enough in most of the patients, so it did not induce long-lasting changes. So if we summarize, if we are stimulating the primary motor cortex, 
using anodal stimulation, 10 days, return electrode is over the contralateral orbit. The results will be decreased pain intensity or decreased pain frequency. Generally, less pain days in the pain diary of the patient, improved quality of life, but improved sleep quality. Uh, there are different studies. Uh, if we stimulate for 10 days, the patients have less pain at least three six weeks. But unfortunately, the pain is coming back slowly if we do not do anything. So we have to repeat this kind of stimulation, let's see, in each two, three months. The other condition, uh, migraine. This is a very typical headache. Uh, more female subject affected than male subject. It's about 12% in Europe in the age range of 25-55. However, here we are stimulating not the primary motor cortex, but the primary visual cortex. Why? Many migraine patients have lower phosphine thresholds. They have predisposition to seeing strong or stronger visual illusion. So it means that the primary visual cortex is hypersensitive or somewhat overactive. And indeed, there is a process called cortical spreading depression that starts in the primary visual cortex when patients have a migraine attack. How can we stop this cortical spreading depression? This was the first, let's say, home TMS stimulator that was developed more than uh, 10 years ago. And the patients were stimulated themselves at home. Mm. This home stimulator would give out just single pulses. It was a double-blinded study. Nevertheless, it came out that the frequency of the migraine attacks was about 70% less in the actively stimulated group compared to the sham stimulator, stimulation group. We just copied this study. And this was our first study uh, with a plenty of problems because that time, um, we had no simulation studies. And for example, I did not know that the thickness of the bone um, over the visual cortex is someone, um, the, so the bone is thicker than even this, uh, over the primary motor cortex. Nevertheless, we use exactly the same protocol of what we were used over the primary motor cortex. So we applied one milliampere. We stimulated three times per week, not in each day, just for 15 minutes. Here, let's say the inhibitor cathode stimulation was used and we compared the result to sham stimulation. The patients had pain diary, how many times they got a migraine attack before, during, and after the stimulation session. And here, the surprise, the frequency of the migraine attacks did not change. There was no difference between the cathodally stimulated group and the sham group. However, the number of migraine-related days decreased significantly after stimulation, mainly in the cathodal group. And the intensity of the migraine attack was less in the cathode group than they had a migraine. So they needed less medication. So what I would do others, I would use a two milliampere stimulation here. Cathode stimulation over the primary photocortex. But I would put 
the anodal electrode over the primary motor cortex and not in the CZ electrode position. This was our second study and the first home stimulation study, what we used in migraine subjects. Here we, we were chosen a group, menstrually related migraine, and we started to stimulate five days before the menstruation. The, we trained the patients how to do the stimulation at home. And 90% of the patients did not have migraine attack during uh, the menstruation in the real stimulated group. The problem was that the migraine came back when they finished the stimulation. So it looks like that continuous stimulation is necessary to stop this migraine attack. And in migraine patients, we used transcranial optical stimulation. This was the first study using an inhibitory protocol over the primary visual cortex. And again, this was the home stimulation study. And the problem was here. So we recruited 40 patients. The patients were trained. They got a stimulator. And we wanted to train, uh, treat here acute migraine attack. So they should have stimulated themselves when the migraine started. For example, with the aura phase or the first uh, pain was experienced. The problem was that 15 patients did not stimulate themselves at home because it was easier to take the medication than put on the electrodes on the head and waiting for the effect of the stimulation. Nevertheless, we collected um, 103 uh, migraine attacks. And um, in the real stimulation group, they had significantly less pain after stimulation compared to the sham stimulation group. Nevertheless, this, this was, I have to tell you, this was not the best protocol. and my best study, this was an, a little bit uh, underpowered study because we lost 15 patients. Considerations. So, we have to uh, take care of plenty of factors because I'm sure that age, gender of the subject have a significant effect on the outcome, and maybe the circadian rhythms, what I mentioned, the brain state or the neuronal history, Almost all of the patients are stressed. The high cortisol level can change the efficacy of the stimulation and, of course, the underlying mechanism of pain. Medication can modify the efficacy of the stimulation. For example, if the patients are under um, antidepressive uh, treatment using um, um, acetalopram, citalopram, we can prolong the effect of the stimulation. The same effect has, for example, amphetamine or an antibiotic called um, d -cycloserin. We have this bipolar effect of the anodal cathode stimulation only in rest. And it was um, already proven previous studies in the primary visual cortex or in the primary motor cortex. If the patients have a cognitive task, or a motor task during stimulation. Even when we are watching TV, we have a problem because the stimulation can go in another direction. Or has no effect at all. Why it is? It is a very good um, summary. Um, if the neurons are pre-activated, the channels are already open, and the current is going, flowing through these channels and probably therefore we have leaky channels and no effect. Nevertheless, concerning combination, what probably one of the best ones, let's say in chronic pain point of condition is fibromyalgia. And one of my PhD students, uh, Perian Ramasavmi, just had a huge study and um, he's just analyzing 
uh, the data. One paper is already submitted. Mm, if you have questions, please, you can see his email address here and ask him. Here what we did, that the patient learned how to meditate before we started the stimulation. This was a Zoom training. And after they got their stimulation, the stimulator, this was a home stimulator study. They used the stimulation combined with the meditation. Again, 10 days, 2 milliampere applied over the primary motor cortex. Even meditation improved the pain perception significantly. However, when it was combined with another stimulation, we had a stronger effect. And a relatively long-lasting effect. I have a feeling that this effect will long last, let's say, for months, between three and six months. We have plenty of open questions when we are using transcranial electrical stimulation, low-intensity electrical stimulation in chronic pain. How can we reach this long-lasting effect? As I mentioned just a minute ago, we can combine it with another method. It's not important that meditation, but maybe we can combine it um, like um, listening music. Maybe it has the same effect. Um, when we should repeat the next session of stimulation, should we wait until the patient has pain again? Or can we give something like a maintenance doses, let's say every five or six weeks? There are no studies. Um, do, we do not know if we have adverse effects associated with long-term use. Should we increase the intensity of the stimulation or duration of the stimulation if we want to stimulate for years? Because plenty of patients are taking medication for years. Mm, the longest treated patient is, I think, she's using the stimulation for six years now for face pain. And at the case of this patient, we, we did not change the original protocol. She's repeating the stimulation in every three, four months. Okay. Uh, and this is my last slide because the time is over. The problem is that if we have a patient, what we can see is the pain pathology or what the patient is telling us, how much pain she or he has. Maybe if we have good questionnaires or good methods, we can measure the stress resilience of the patient. We can measure the cortisol level. We can document the emotional state of the patient. Mm, and maybe we can genotype the patient. Nevertheless, what we cannot see many times, and we cannot consider that what happens in the body. And everything what we induce or we do in the brain. So, for example, when we start stimulate, has an effect on the body. And everything what happens in the body has an effect on the brain. Uh, for example, just an example, fibromyalgia patients, they have abnormal heart rate variability. And we did not consider it before. So this is my last slide. And I would like to suggest for future studies that we are using holistic treatment approaches and measuring not changes what happening in the vein but measuring changes what happening in the body too. So thank you very much. And I am ready to respond to your questions. Yeah, my time mm -hmm. is over. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Anta, for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm sure the presentation was insightful for a lot of us in the audience. I think it's one of the first webinars on this topic that we've hosted um, mm -hmm. as ANC also. So very interesting.